I finished my last lecture with the paintings of Baroque Spain's superstar, Diego Velazquez. The College Board did not include other Spanish Baroque works, at least Spanish Baroque works from Spain, on the list. But I worry that the focus on Velazquez, who is essentially a court painter, gives you a misleading picture of Spanish Baroque art. By far the biggest customer for art in Spain was the church, and it's Spanish Baroque religious paintings that most deeply influenced Spanish colonial art, which is where we're heading today. So let's just glance at a few Spanish Baroque religious paintings. Zurbaran was a contemporary of Velazquez, and he's best known for his portraits and religious paintings. This painting is typical of Zurbaran's style. It reflects an austere Catholic piety, deep contrasts of light and dark, and sharp edges and line. Note that he does not use impasto or blurred lines the way we saw with Velazquez. This saint preached to the Muslims, which pretty much guaranteed pursuit of martyrdom. Here is the martyrdom of St. Bartholomew by Ribera who's one of my favorite Spanish painters. Ribera painted in much the same tense, dramatic, tenebrous style as Zurbaran, but I would say with slightly softer lines. So what Baroque features do you see? There are the twisted figures, the dramatic use of light and dark or chiaroscuro, the emphasis on a saint, go counter-reformation, intentional foreshortening of figures that move out into space, or what we've been describing as open composition. The contrast between the dark, grim scene at the bottom of the painting and the vibrant blue sky above also suggests a theological message, suffering brings redemption. Murillo, not Velazquez, was for centuries the most admired Spanish Baroque painter. So do these works remind you of any other artists we've studied? How about Raphael, or maybe Rubens or Titian? We see more emphasis on color than line, softer outlines, and frankly, a more sentimental vision. Okay, now we finally get to cross the ocean. Today we're going to only briefly encounter civilizations that we will look at in more detail in a later unit, the Aztecs and the Inca. Both civilizations were thriving when the Spanish arrived in the 15th century, although European diseases, which had arrived a few years earlier, were already devastating the indigenous population. At any rate, the art we're going to study today is Mannerist and Baroque, but heavily influenced, as we'll see, by contacts with the Aztec and Inca empires and, interestingly, with Spain's new colony in the Philippines, which brought the New World into contact with civilizations of China and Japan. So I'm going to ask you to watch this rather long crash course clip because it manages to give us a preview of the Aztecs and Incas, introduce the Spanish Empire, and review what's happening in 17th century Europe all in about seven minutes. Even I can't talk that fast. In 1494, right after Columbus first sailed the ocean blue, Pope Alexander VI issued a papal bull basically dividing the world between Spain and Portugal and urging those countries to spread the Gospels in their territories. Keep in mind that in 1494, Constantinople had only recently fallen to the Turks. A newly united Spain had just expelled the last Muslim kingdom, Granada, and the Ottoman armies were starting their sweep through Eastern Europe that barely stopped two years later just outside Vienna in 1683. So in a few minutes we'll be looking at a Mexican image of the Habsburg victory over the Turks at the siege of Belgrade in 1688. Here's an Ottoman image of an earlier siege of Belgrade from 1521. The Muslim Turks won that one and would rule Belgrade for the next 150 years. And then of course there was that pesky Martin Luther with his hammer and nails. The Reconquista had fired Spanish Catholicism but the church felt as embattled as it did triumphant. And that's going to show up in our as well. Franciscan missionaries traveled to the New World at least as early as Columbus's second voyage, and from the very beginning, Spain was committed to winning the inhabitants of its new land to Roman Catholic Christianity. This is a complicated story with some real Christian heroes. Almost all of the efforts to protect indigenous people from forced labor, from slavery, and from other atrocities were led by priests. But, of course, sometimes the priests cooperated with mistreatment and oppression as well. Again, it's too long a story to tell here, but I do want to explore one very important document, if only briefly, because it gives us a sense of what art could and could not accomplish. The Spanish requirement 
or requerimiento, Ms. Jacobs can correct my pronunciation, was by order of King Ferdinand and his daughter read to peoples that the Spaniards conquered or otherwise encountered. So here's the opening paragraph. What mixed message does this send? A mixed message that's going to show up in Spanish colonial art as well. Well, subduers of barbarous nations is not very subtle, although you should remember that Ferdinand is referring at least as much to the Moors as to the Aztecs and other indigenous peoples in colonial America. But the last part of the paragraph also establishes a kinship between Spaniards and their new subjects. All are created by the same God. All are descended from Adam. All will be saved by the new Adam Christ. It is sort of a declaration of brotherhood. So here again, what double message is the king sending? On the one hand, both the king and his subjects are under authority, a higher authority, St. Peter and his spiritual descendants, the popes. But of course, the popes have given the king's authority over these new subjects. And what's the final double message? Well, by all means, take your time. Think over the claims of this new religion. Ponder and pray. Be persuaded by the truth of what we are saying or else we're going to make war on you, enslave your wives and children, and take all your goods. Well, I think we'll see this confusing dual communication of promise and threat, brotherhood and subjection carry through into the art of Spanish colonial America. So you saw in the video that Spain divided its conquered territories into vice royalties. Of the four works we will look at today, three hail from the Viceroyalty of New Spain, headquartered in Mexico City and heavily influenced by contacts with the Aztecs and the peoples they conquered. But we'll begin with a work from what began as the Viceroyalty of Peru and was then split into three Viceroyalties. No, this is not a College Board required work, although it is in your workbook, Volume 2, page 92. All of today's art is in the Art of the America section. We changed our mind about when to teach it after we put the, put our book together, sorry. This painting is in your book because it's my favorite Spanish colonial Baroque work, probably because it's one I've actually seen in the Cathedral of Cusco, Peru. Zapata was a member of the Cusco School of Painting, which was a group, group comprised of a few European immigrants and more mestizo and Indian artists. Zapata, Zapata himself was at least partly Quechuan or Inca. The painters in Cusco learn mostly from prints of European paintings, and their style tends to blend local culture into the traditional painting of the conquistadors. So I think you can all recognize the iconography of the Last Supper. But what Incan elements may have snuck in? First, what are they eating? The meat on the platter is cuy, or guinea pig. Cuy was the animal traditionally sacrificed at Inca agricultural festivals, so it offers a parallel to the lamb, the traditional Christian sacrificial animal. And yes, I sampled cuy in Peru three different times. The dinner beverage, likewise, is probably not wine, but a traditional Peruvian drink, chicha, which was made from maize. Didn't try that one. We also see two platters of native foods that include multicolored potatoes as well as spicy peppers and corn. With images like these, Spanish missionaries helped their new Incan converts relate the new faith to their existing beliefs and customs. And like Caravaggio, this artist is bringing Christ into the recognizable lives of ordinary people. But is it possible that Zapata managed to work in a little subversion as well? The guides in the cathedral like to point out the figure of Judas. I've circled him in green, and you'll see that he's clutching a money bag under, his, under the table. This Judas bears a striking resemblance to Francisco Pizarro, the conquistador uh, credited with capturing and murdering the Inca emperor Atahualpa although it is impossible to know whether this was the original intention of the artist or a later interpretation. We don't have evidence. Uh, the link between Judas and Pizarro is certainly understandable given Pizarro's infamous role in the bloody onset of colonial rule in Peru. Okay, this one is a required work, and it's a, one of a very interesting group of paintings that I never knew existed. I don't say this very often, but thank you, College Board. So if you were to see this painting without any label or background, what period would you assign it to? I think it looks quite mannerist, 
Look at those elaborate clothes, those soft, limp hands, even though they're holding a gun, and the distorted body. The head is too small, the body's too large, but the elaborate treatment of the textiles may also point to some Flemish influence. So what is with that costume? Well, the outfit is probably mostly inspired by the Viceroy Guard's uniforms. They were the only regular military force in the region, and the painting on the right shows the Guard escorting the Viceroy. The angel's jacket uses more cloth, especially in those enormous sleeves, which would not be very efficient in battle, but they are a traditional way of showing off wealth. But the angel's costume also includes some element of Incan royalty's traditional ceremonial costumes, which used feathers and brightly patterned woven textiles. We'll see those when we get to the Art of the Americas unit. So the gun-toting angel on the left, which is also painted by the master of Calamarca, offers a better comparison. The figure on the right is dressed in the traditional royal Inca garb for the Intirani, or sun, ceremony. Actually, these gun-toting angels show up in painting all through the Andean region, so here are three more. Interestingly, the Catholic Church had been cracking down on paintings of angels. They saw them as too closely associated with magic and superstition. One of the rulings of the Council of Trent that we haven't discussed is that biblical subjects should be portrayed with fidelity to the Bible and to Christian history. In other words, no legendary saints, no events that were invented in the Middle Ages, no magic. In the Americas, however, interest in angels was actually on the rise. Now, magic spirits had always played an important role in indigenous religion, and angels offered the church an opportunity to grab their would-be converts' attention with something that seemed, well, magical. And what was more magical anyway, besides angels, than those arquebuses, which conquistadors had used to overwhelm much larger indigenous armies? It's easy to see how guns might come to be seen as imbued with magical or spiritual powers. The Counter-Reformation Church also embraced triumphal imagery, expressing the absolute all-conquering power of the papacy, the Roman Church, the sacraments, the Virgin as Queen of Heaven, the saints, the true faith, and the cross, which was redefined in many paintings really as a standard of victory. Well, the arquebus was in its way a standard of victory as well, and it was a symbol of the protection that the church would extend to Christian converts in lands where Christianity had not yet received full acceptance. But miracles are not the same as magic, and the Catholic Church readily embraced miracles, especially those involving the Virgin Mary. Now, my students all know this story. They attend Juan Diego Catholic High School, after all. The year was 1531. Cortez had conquered Mexico City just a decade earlier, but Franciscan missionaries had already won many converts to the Catholic faith, and one of these converts was an Indian peasant farmer named Juan Diego. Juan Diego was walking to Mass along Tepeyac Hill when he began to hear beautiful strains of music. He looked up, and he saw a lady who called his name. She introduced herself, I'm the Virgin Mary, and explained that she wanted a church built on this location in her honor. Juan Diego went off to see the bishop, which must have required some courage for an Indian peasant. But the bishop was a little skeptical. He needed a sign. So Mary told Juan Diego to go to the top of the mountain and pick some flowers. Juan Diego went up to the hill, which was dry and barren, really a place where only cactus grew. But there he found roses, not native to Mexico, but the kind that grow in Castilla, where the bishop was from. He gathered the, the flowers in his tilma, which was a garment like a poncho. Juan Diego brought these to Mary, who arranged them and said to take the tilma to the bishop. When Juan Diego opened his tilma in the bishop's presence, the bishop saw not just the flowers of Spain, but the image of the Virgin on the cloak. The church, no surprise, was promptly built. The images in Roundel surrounding the Virgin in this work tell the tale of Juan Diego that I've just related, albeit in an abridged form. Now here's the image of the Virgin that now resides in the Shrine of Guadalupe, and is really the more famous image. We know, by the way, from recent infrared studies of the tilma that her cloak, the moon under her feet, and the angel with folded cloth supporting her were added a little later in the 1600s. 
The church was built on the site of a temple to the Aztec mother goddess, which the Spaniards had destroyed. Partly for this reason, there was a fair amount of controversy within the church over the cult that soon grew up around the Virgin of Guadalupe. Was this a genuine miracle, or was it some of the hocus-pocus that the Counter-Reformation Church was trying to stamp out? A number of priests actually expressed concern that the veneration of the Virgin of the Guadalupe was just thinly disguised worship of the Aztec mother goddess. I'm not going to get into that debate, but my students at least know that the church eventually embraced Juan Diego and his vision. He was canonized in 2002. So where does all this imagery come from? One answer is the book of Revelation. I've put the passage up on the slide. But the images also had great significance within the indigenous culture. So, for example, Mary's rose-tinted flowery tunic symbolized the earth, while her turquoise starry mantle represented the heavens. The mantle also indicated that she is royalty, since only the native emperors wore cloaks of that color. There are three suns represented in the image. The first sun, which isn't visible, is the cosmic sun that casts light on the Virgin's left side and creates a shadow. Golden rays from the second sun behind her signify that she is the mother of light, greater than the Aztec sun god whom she has eclipsed. And the third sun is represented by the four-petaled flower on her tunic, indicating that she is about to give birth to the almighty sun. The black ribbon around her waist shows she's expecting a child. For the Aztecs, the trapezoid-shaped ends of the ribbon also represented the end of one cycle and the birth of a new era. Nine golden flowers, symbolizing life and truth, adorn Mary's dress. The flowers are made up of glyphs representing a hill and a river. The indigenous people considered hills the highest point of encounter between God and people. The only four-petaled flower on Mary's tunic appears over her womb. The four-petaled jasmine represents the Aztec's highest deity, Ometeotl. While Ometeotl remained distant, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe shows that one true God chose to be born of a woman, making himself accessible to all. The Virgin stands on a crescent moon. The Aztec word for Mexico, Metzhikko, means in the center of the moon. The moon also symbolizes the Aztec moon god, fertility, birth, and life. An angel with eagle wings appears below Mary's feet. According to Aztec belief, an eagle delivered the hearts and the blood of sacrificial victims to the gods. The angel holds up the pregnant virgin, signifying that the child in her womb is the offering that pleases God. Whew, that's a lot, but you get the general idea. There, are, There is a lot of Aztec imagery as well as Christian imagery. On the right, you see the goddess Cuauhtilque. Notice that that sounds a little like Guadalupe, and some scholars think that Guadalupe is a Spanish version of the Aztec name. According to the legend of the Aztecs, Cuauhtilque was magically impregnated while she was still a virgin by a ball of feathers that fell on her while she was sweeping a temple. Actually, she went on to have 400 children, and they eventually decapitated her. Many statues of this goddess show her performing human sacrifice, and the Virgin Mary must have seemed like a step up. But note that all of these symbols also conform to the passage in Revelation and to symbols commonly associated with the Virgin. So there's really controversy about what this means. Our required work, though, isn't the famous image in the Guadalupe Shrine, but rather a copy made in Enconchado style, that means with inlaid mother of pearl. By the way, it's also not the image you saw in the Khan Academy video. This is a very similar work that's now in the Los Angeles Museum of Art. The museum website has a good short note about this work, and here's an excerpt. Inspired by Asian decorative arts, this special technique was invented in Mexico and is known as enconchado. Concha means shell in Spanish. Throughout the colonial period, there was a significant influx of Asian goods to Mexico via the legendary Manila galleons. Those are ships that connected the east to the west from Philippines to uh, the Pacific coast of Mexico. So this work is signed by Miguel Gonzalez, who along with his brother Juan Gonzalez is considered the foremost painter of Enconchados. It depicts the Virgin placed on top of an eagle perched on a cactus, Mexico City's legendary coat of arms. This is a significant detail because this is an example of rapid creolization 
of the cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe. In other words, the assumption that she is a local virgin, that she is a representative of the Mexicans and not just of Spain. And this is happening in the second half of the 17th century, part of a growing local sense of identity. And as the Khan Academy video noticed, noted, her dark skin also endeared the virgin to the darker-skinned indigenous people of Mexico. And Conchado paintings often include ornate frames such as this, and notice that they're inspired by and really copying Japanese lacquer work. They enhance the preciousness and luminosity of the work, and they were considered an inherent part of it. So again, this is a fusion of Eastern and Western, Western artistic traditions in the middle in New Spain. And speaking of Enconchado and the Gonzalez family, we're moving on to our next work, which is also from Mexico. I just talked about Mexico's ties with Asia via the Philippines and the influence of Japanese art, in particular, um, excuse me, the influence of Asian art, especially the art of Japan. This was new to me, by the way, and I have really enjoyed learning about this work. Part of the screen, that that's the part that's required, now resides in the Brooklyn Museum, so once again I'm going to avail myself of a useful museum blurb, and I quote, This Biombo Enconchado is the only known work to combine the two elite Mexican genres of Biombos, folding screens, and remember that name is very similar to the Japanese name, and shell inlay paintings, later known as Enconchados. Commissioned by the Viceroy of New Spain, it was most likely displayed in Mexico's Viceregal Palace, where it would have divided a ceremonial stateroom from a more intimate sitting room. The rest of it, by the way, is in Mexico City. So the scene from the Great Turkish War of 1683-89 to was based on a Dutch print, which is shown here. These prints, especially the cheaper black and white versions, were very popular with Dutch citizens who were following the wars in Europe with great interest. No CNN back in those days, remember? This was the side that faced the formal reception room. What message did it send? Don't mess with the Habsburgs. Remember that at this point, the Habsburg dynasty still ruled Spain. Although, as it happened, they were going to lose out to the Bourbons very soon. The gold paint, the shell inlay, the shiny black paint imitating lacquer would all have showcased the Viceroy's wealth as well as the wealth of Spain. This was back before electricity. Think of how candlelight would have flickered off these shining surfaces. What other works that we've studied are designed to create a similar effect? mosaics. The decorative hunting scene on the reverse is also based on a European source and it was better suited for the more intimate women's sitting room than it faced. Uh, actually, I should have said this before, the scene is based on the Medici court artist designs for tapestries for Cosimo the First Villa. Again, all these connections. The rich floral border and the garlands tied with red ribbons along the tops of the hunt scenes recall the kinds of decorative elements that would have appeared in the tapestries. Both of the main scenes and the decorative borders are embellished with gold paint and inlaid shell work, again, more sparkle by candlelight. Uh, what's most interesting about this work, I think, is that it's truly an international production, influenced by Dutch and Japanese art, yet produced in Mexico by local artists using local materials that imitate Japanese techniques. Globalization was already well underway. Uh, one other interesting factoid. The Viceroy's wife was actually an Aztec princess who traced her lineage to Moctezuma, which is a nice lead-in to our final Spanish colonial work for this unit. Actually, I realize now I should have stuck this painting into the next unit because this is really a work of a slightly later period than the Baroque. So here's a trailer for our next unit. It's all about scientific inquiry and rationalism. Remember how I talked about how each artistic generation was trying to one-up the previous generation? These folks were tired of Gopher Baroque. They, wa they were tired of the appeal to emotions. They wanted to go back to reason. Thank you very much. And though it seems odd and more than a little offensive to us, this and other so-called Costa paintings in part reflected the spirit of scientific inquiry. Think of your elementary school chemistry projects. What happens when you mix baking soda and vinegar? But of course, the Costa paintings also carry a message about racial superiority. 
In fact, Mexican Creoles, that is Mexicans of Spanish descent, who were hoping to gain more power in, from Spain for self-rule, were critical of these paintings. Why, would you guess? Well, they were worried that the king and his court back in Spain would conclude that Creoles were intermarrying, that they were a mixed race, and that would weaken their claim to self-rule. Actually, it was often true that they were a mixed race. So, here's a complete Costa tableau that hung in the Madrid Museum of Natural History. Note, natural history, not art in the early 1800s. So people would have examined it the way we examine dinosaur bones and Anasazi rope sandals. This wasn't art, really. It was science. The tableau should be read from top to bottom, and note that our old friend, the Virgin of Guadalupe, is hovering protectively over all of these people. The couples in the top row all have at least one European. Note their elegant clothing. And in our required work, even the Indian woman is clearly upper caste, perhaps like the viceroy's wife and Aztec princess. Move further down the tableau and the people get darker, the clothing becomes simpler, and in cases where an occupation is shown, the occupations become more ordinary, less elevated. The Costa paintings were often produced in sets of 16. Notice that the descendants of Africans appear at the bottom, and note how the clothing changes as you move downward. So here on the left, you see a mestizo and an Indian with their children. They're dressed in peasant garb, and the donkey and produce suggest they're farmers. The Negro and Indian, shown with fruits and vegetables native to the regions where many descendants of Africans lived. Again, remember that this was meant to be scientific documentation. So, are these paintings entirely insulting to persons portrayed as belonging, quite literally, on the way the paintings are set up, to lower races? Well, the whole enterprise is, is really off-putting to our modern sensibilities, but I'd argue that the paintings themselves are surprisingly sympathetic portraits of the families. Remember that these religious people would have been familiar with paintings of the Holy Family. It strikes me that there is at least some resemblance here. But now we're going to leave the world of Catholic Europe and its colonies and return for our last lecture to the new heart of the Protestant Revolution and of the art world, the Netherlands.